Alrighty, welcome back to Reviews with Elaine, because I have opinions. And I'm gonna have a lot of them today. Uh, today's opinions will be about 16 Ways to Defend a Walled City by K.J. Parker. So, I forced myself to finish this book out of sheer bloody-mindedness, because I hate leaving books unfinished. Uh, I don't regret finishing it. I regret starting it at all. And I will say, up until about 70 pages to the end, I thought this was just, you know, a fine book that wasn't the book for me, but I could see how some people could like it. Then this book completely changed my mind. Uh, so first, in my opinion, this is not a fantasy book, even though it is categorized in that genre. Uh, this is an alternative world Roman historical fiction. Yes, the places, the peoples, and the cultures are not ones that exist in our history, but they are clear analogs for ones that exist in our history. Uh, and there is no magic, no fantasy races, no alternative fix physics. Uh, there are no gods actively interacting and interfering with the narrative. I thought for a while that some of the people had blue skin, but it turns out that was just a weird colloquialism for people with brown skin. Uh, and as far as I know, there is not actually a name for this particular genre of something that is just an alternative world, like different names, different places, but still clearly an allegory for our world, but lacking all magic. Uh, and I do think that there should be a name for whatever the hell this genre is, because I would be happy to read more books in this genre. Uh, but not this one. Uh, and I will die on the hill saying that this is not fantasy. I will give you speculative fiction. Maybe call it historical speculative fiction. But it's not fantasy. But the story follows Orhan, who is an engineer in the Robear army. Uh, a series of slightly ridiculous events lead him to being the highest ranked member of the military left in the seat of the Empire when a ridiculously large army shows up to sack the city. He is left with his Corps of Engineers, the City Watch, and civilians to guard the city. The rest is basically just a thought experiment, where the author tries to show off how much better an engineer would be at this than any actual soldier or politician. Uh, so I'm going to start this review with the thoughts I had on this book before we got to the point that it absolutely burned through all my goodwill. I realized pretty early on that this book is what I think of as a thought experiment book, a book written for an author to just play around with an idea. In this case, how a peasant-born engineer would run defense and siege warfare. And for what it is, this book did a good enough job of it. I learned a lot about pre-gunpowder siege warfare. And yeah, as a fantasy author, that is information that I could probably use at some point. But I have an inherent problem with the thought experiment books. They all read a bit like, look at how smart I am. Look at how smart my characters are. My characters could have done so much better than anyone in history because I'm so creative and educated and smart. They also feel a bit like listening to someone explain their D&D &D campaign with, to you. Uh, not always uninteresting, but inherently a little bit masturbatory. Uh, and the main character here makes this all feel even more self-aggrandizing. Orhan feels arrogant even when he's calling himself an idiot. Partially because he's always explaining why he came up with the ideas that no one else could, why he knows information that nobody else knows, why he is able to rise to the position no one else of his race could. He's constantly calling his friends and allies dense, stupid, or irrational. He talks constantly about how he doesn't understand people. He only understands things because things make sense. Machines do what you design them to do. A plank of wood is going to be a plank of wood. But people react. They follow stupid ideals. They think morally. Even the people he describes as his best friend, he points out and takes advantage of moments when they do irrational, stupid things. Orhan basically compares himself to Jesus at one point. And yeah, the character, of course, does not know what that would mean to the readers in our world. Uh, in his time and place, the, this is just some little weird cult that Orhan thinks will never catch on. 
and he doesn't even use the name Jesus. But the author knows that we will read that as Orhan comparing himself to Jesus, and knows what that will re mean to a modern reader. He has to know how gratingly arrogant his protagonist was going to come across. I also want to say that I just think I'm not this author's reader. Uh, I've read two of his works now, uh, because both, like, he was just listed at by, like, this author might be a comp to me, so I gave two of them a chance. And I think it's safe to say that it isn't the specific book that I have a problem with. His writing is just a little bit smarmy. Uh, but I don't hate the prose style. Uh, it's intensely readable. Uh, he throws grammar out the window at times, but he knows when he can do it without making the prose confusing. Uh, his writing reads very much like spoken language, and he writes with an intensely strong voice. I knew who this protagonist was by the end of the first page, and the super familiar, casual, informal voice does good work towards making an unlikable POV character likable. Uh, but the problem is, this character is just too damn unlikable for that to win me over. Uh, Orhan does some shitty-ass things, and no amount of friendly tone, self-effacement, or moralizing is going to win me back over to his side. Uh, that being said, there were also some problems with the basic storytelling. The author clearly did not feel like wasting words on such inconsequential details like transitions between scenes, telling us where or when we were in a conversation, or building context. Uh, there were multiple times that the narrator tells us Orhan is doing something cl clever, which is grating because the narrator is Orhan, but doesn't tell us what is happening until after we see the effect that he was causing. And then it goes back to explain, which was needlessly convoluted. Uh, sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't, but rarely did I think it added anything to the narration. Uh, there were also passing moments of interesting philosophizing on right and wrong, but it was never really fully expounded on. There was a lot of, I know what would actually be right, but I did this instead from our narrator without really exploring why he was doing this. Uh, there was also some rather clumsy commentary on race, but now I'm going to talk about why I came very close to not finishing this book. So this book was not great from the beginning when it came to female representation. Uh, there are really four female characters in the entire book, and I'm going to address each one of them. Uh, there will be spoilers. I don't care. Uh, first we have Aichma. So Orhan was her father's best friend. Orhan slept with her mother. We'll get to that. Her mother died in childbirth with a child that was Orhan's. I'm not actually entirely sure if that child was Aichma or another child, but he is definitely set up as having cared about this woman. Uh, she is one of the few people on his list of those he will save if the city falls. Uh, he talks about how smart she is, but 95% of her appearances in this book are her acting as a sounding board for him. Like, he asks a question he already knows his answer to, and coaches her towards his answer. Which is super patronizing! Uh, but worse than that, in the first scene she is introduced, two pages in, come this paragraph. Vanity is her one weakness. She knows she's pretty, because men tell her, over and over again, and it brings her nothing but aggravation but I'm the only one who tells her she's clever. Good job on calling her vain, saying you're the only one who notices she's smart, and then congratulating on s yourself on seeing a woman as a person. Great fucking job. And I mean, yeah, Orn Han is not meant to be a great person. I do believe there are places for characters and even protagonists who are misogynists. We can learn from them learning. We can enjoy seeing them brought low by their faults. We can even just tisk at them as they make bad choices. But for that to work, the book has to recognize and draw attention to the fact that this is a fault. 
We need to see them brought low by their mistake. We need to hear better characters, the narrator, or even the character themselves saying that this is bad. We need to see the character grow. The problem is, this book doesn't read like the author thinks mis Orhan is a misogynist. I'm pretty sure the author thinks misogyny is one of the few faults Orhan doesn't have. Because, look, he realizes a woman can be smart, too. <sighs> and it gets worse. Uh, there's another moment when Orhan is trying to convince her to take on a job that she knows she is not qualified for, and we get this gem. Getting her to do what you want is like getting a pig into a cart. If you push it, it backs up the other way with all its considerable strength. You've got to make it want to go into the cart, or it just won't happen. Now, that is not implying that Aichma is a pig. But he's calling her stubborn, and implying that Orhan is manipulating her for her own good, and whether he is calling her one or not, he has now associated the woman, who at this point is literally the only female character in the book, with a pig! That's a heavy strike, too. Uh, for the rest of the book, Aichma basically just appears to remind Orhan of what he's fighting for. Uh, she gets stabbed so he can have emotions at an important moment. Uh, she delivers him one important piece of intel that she learns by chance. Uh, she tries to talk him into making a deal with the enemy to save herself. But at least there are other female characters, right? Well, next we have Sawdust. And yes, this woman's name is Sawdust. It's not her real name, it's the name everyone calls her, even though it's stated she does not like this name. Uh, and yes, Sawdust is traded between warring factions, like an object. But at least Orhan acknowledges her worth and her intelligence. He does talk about how weak she is, how she can't fight, but at least she has heroic moments. Uh, or a heroic moment. Uh, but she also sparked one of the most insulting moments in this entire book on page 324. Have you noticed, by the way, that women don't fight? Even on the rare occasions when they scrap with each other, it's all slaps and scratches. They don't try to maim or kill. And as for soldier fighting, sharp weapons, blunt trauma, chops and cuts and slices, butcher's work, they don't do that. It's not in their nature. Bullshit. I don't even believe that this character has never seen a woman maim or kill someone. He is from one of the savage tribes that are clearly based on uh, Germanic tribes. And yeah, there were female warriors in the Germanic tribes. I guess when the author was doing his very minimal research on gladiators and the Hippodrome, which features heavily in this book, he never learned that there were female gladiators too. And no, they didn't have slap fights for the entertainment of the masses. But it's shit like this that makes me want to do some of that butcher's work he claims women don't do. But then we have the other two women. I don't remember their names, and I don't feel like flipping through the book to find them. Uh, the important thing is that their stories mirror each other, and the telling of the stories is flipped back and forth between uh, the two passage by pass. We get one passage from this woman, and then go back and get another passage from this woman, and go back and go back and go back. Uh, one of these women is Aichma's mother. The other is Orgus's wife. Both are referred to as my best friend's wife by the narrator. Both are introduced to him by their doting husbands. Both inform Orhan that they hate their husbands as soon as they are left alone with him. Both of them ask him to help plan to murder their husbands, who, I will remind you, are Orhan's best friends. Both sleep with him. The crowning moment of this little passage of back and forth terribleness uh, comes from the second woman's story who our na narrator describes this woman as beautif so beautiful, his words cannot do her justice. She proposes she will kill her husband and give Orhan command of the army. After some back and forth, he agrees on the condition that she will marry him. She agrees because she knows that as a woman, she will need a man to take command after she has murdered her current husband. And then we get this fucking gem of a line. We sealed our bargain. Not my finest hour, though she was very polite and long-suffering. 
but it had been a long time, and besides, my mind was on other things. Winches, lifting gear, the reliability of Polynesis' histories, the effective range of trebuchets, and the drying time of my special pumice mortar. Not even my finest... Not even my not finest hour. More like 15 minutes. In case you can't wrap your mind around that, this man, who is supposed to be our hero, our protagonist, presumably meant to be at least slightly likable, just coerced a woman into having sex with him, admitted she did not enjoy it, and then makes a joke about finishing too quickly because his mind was on siege warfare. Also, this means that two out of four total women in this entire book are portrayed as murdering their loving, doting husbands. And yeah, there's a random section talking about how the first, at least, was basically forced to marry the man by a lack of options society had given her. But still, two out of four women are portrayed as self-serving, adulterous, cold-hearted murderers. A one of them dies in childbirth, which our protagonist describes as, I killed her with my dick. The other is slaughtered when Orhan tells her husband she is plotting against him, after I remind you coercing her into sex. So yeah, while Orhan was coercing her into sex in exchange for his cooperation, he was planning on betraying her all along, which is adding murderous insult on top of injury. She is then scalped, and her skin used to cover a book, which I'm pretty sure would have taken longer than the author realizes, because this is portrayed as happening in like a day or two, and, oh, would not have preserved her beautiful golden hair. But that means it's both illogical and turns one of four female characters into a literal object. Oh, and Orhan's response to this is to note that he'd always wanted to read the book Her Skin is Used to Bind. What the fucking hell on earth is this shit? So the complete list of female characters in this book are the stubborn pig of a possible illegitimate daughter, the too-weak-to-fight carpenter, a long-dead adulterous woman who was killed by Orhan's dick, and the murderous adulterous woman who, sla who is slaughtered to make the dust jacket for a book. If this is the best you can do when you're writing women, maybe just fucking don't. Don't include any women. I'd prefer not to see a single woman on the page written by you. Uh, on a positive note, there's a passing mention that implies one character might be queer, and then that's made fun of. So, thanks for that representation too. Just no. So, no. I don't suggest you read that fucking book. I threw it and I'm not picking it back up. I am mad I read it at all. By the way, fun fact, I kept throwing that book, even though I still needed it for the review, because I was just too mad at it. So, yeah, sorry the ending of the review, I don't have the book in my hand. I just, I, 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 I had to yeet it. It was all I could do with my soul. I also yeeted it in the short that I made, so, fuck off!